This is another example of what I'm calling opinion pieces. They're not glitzy, they're not fancy, I don't have lots of fancy graphics or video, just my opinion. But I, I hope you come to understand I offer my opinion not to sell you things or persuade you to do something different, but just to kind of present what I believe is the truth, which is becoming an increasingly rare commodity in our world, the internet being an echo chamber, sadly, of misinformation and disinformation. And we've got to work harder and harder, it seems, lately to uncover the real truth in a lot of issues, especially with health, because there's so much money in propagating partial truths or even untruths. So let's talk about what I call the century of antibiotics. So recall that it was 1928 when Dr. Alexander Fleming, a Scottish physician, first uh, discovered that a fungus could kill bacteria. I believe the bacteria was Staphylococcus aureus. Now, it took another decade for someone else to isolate the factor that came from the fungi that killed those bacteria in, in a petri dish, in a culture, and that was named penicillin. So that was a boon. That was a major develop, major wonderful discovery that changed what infections meant. You know, up till then, it wasn't uncommon to require a leg amputation, for instance, if you fractured your leg because a complicated fracture could invite gangrene, sepsis, and death. Likewise, dying from pneumonia was very common. Dying from pyelonephritis, urinary tract infections that became sepsis, that is when microbes entered the bloodstream, was commonly fatal. And so having antibiotics, no questions, there's no, no argument from me that uh, antibiotics and other antimicrobials, such as antifungals, were a great development for humans as a species. So there's no question that saved many lives, million, millions of lives from injury, infections, etc. And having been involved with healthcare over 30 years, I can tell you I've seen all kinds of infections, many complicated infections, staphylococcus wound infections becoming sepsis, pneumococcal pneumonia becoming sepsis, a simple bladder infection that ascended to the kidneys becoming pyelonephritis, kidney infection that then became the urinary sepsis when the organisms of the pyelonephritis entered the bloodstream. So there's no question, you get very sick, even critically ill in some instances, necessitating being put on a ventilator for respiratory support, dialysis for kidney support, what are called pressors or drugs to sustain your, your blood pressure when you go into shock. So no question, right? Antibiotics have played a major role. But I'm not talking about critical illness or life-threatening illness. I'm talking about much more pedestrian, common situations, like your seven-year-old with sniffles and a runny nose, or you with a low-grade fever of 100.4 and a dry cough. And you all know, antibiotics are dispensed very freely, and sometimes it's the patient's or the family's fault, right? It's not uncommon, for instance, for someone to go into the doctor, say with their child, uh, who has maybe a viral respiratory infection, insisting that the child get an antibiotic. So it's, there's blame to spread everywhere, both on the doctor's side as well as the patient-consumer side. And so as a result, there's been wild overuse, overprescription of antibiotics. 650,000 prescriptions are written for antibiotics every day. 650,000 per day. It's not uncommon for most of us by age 40 to have taken 30 rounds of antibiotics, and of course more as you get older. Uh, children, newborns, get tons of antibiotics. So it's not uncommon for children, for every 1,000 children, for more than 1,300 prescriptions for antibiotics are written every year, every year, year after year. So we've been wildly overexposed to antibiotics. Well, w why is that an issue? Well, there are many implications, many consequences of that overuse of antibiotics. All it takes, we know this with confidence, all it takes is one course, one course, not 30 courses, but one course of antibiotics to decimate, to kill, often irreversibly, hundreds of species in your gastrointestinal tract, as well as other microbiome locations. So recall that it's becoming clear virtually every part of the body has its own unique micro, or supposed to have its own unique microbiome, including the mouth, 
skin, vagina, prostate, brain, airway, on and on. All these body locations are meant to have a unique microbial signature that keeps those areas healthy. Well, an antibiotic disrupts that balance and kills off mostly susceptible species, which tend to be beneficial species, and tend not to kill many pathogenic or undesirable species. So in the gastrointestinal tract specifically, a course of antibiotic, let's say clarithromycin or something like that, will kill off lactobacillus species, bifidobacteria species, fecalobacteria species, acromantia, lactnospiracea, clostridia species. These are species that did good things for us. Many good things, beneficial metabolites, protected the gastrointestinal lining, the mucus barrier, amplified the intestinal immune response, sent signals to your brain, to muscle, to other organs to support their function. So losing beneficial microbes is a very big problem in health. And in their place, the proliferation of unhealthy microbes, mostly, not entirely, but mostly what are called proteobacteria species. These are species that may seem familiar to you, may sound familiar, because they have, they go into names like E. coli, Klebsiella, Salmonella, many of the same microbes that, by the way, cause food poisoning. When you went to a restaurant or some other place where food was prepared by somebody who did not clean their hands after moving their bowels, so your fecal contamination, or prep surfaces or utensils likewise contained by fecal microbes. So we know that these proteobacteria, gram-negative proteobacteria, it's a very specific class of microbes, over-proliferate when you're exposed to antibiotics. Now the incredible thing about that is it doesn't end there. So loss of beneficial species that were working to suppress those proteobacteria, proteobacteria now can proliferate unrestrained in the colon, but even more so may ascend. It's not quite, quite clear why and how this happens exactly, but those proteobacteria are allowed to ascend into the 24 feet of small intestine, into the ileum, then up into the jejunum, into the duodenum, stomach, and probably higher. So there's massive overproliferation of trillions, trillions of proteobacterial fecal microbial species into the 24 feet of small intestine. Well, that's a very different situation than when fecal microbes are confined to the colon. The colon is more or less accustomed to this. You can have problems in the colon also because we know that overgrowth of proteobacteria and other species can lead to conditions like ulcerative colitis or colon cancer, right? So that's, those are colonic issues, diverticular disease, diverticulitis. But the real, much more common problem is when those fecal microbes ascend into the small intestine. Because the small intestine is meant to be permeable, that's where you and I absorb amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals. We want that absorb absorbability, but not when the small intestine becomes overpopulated by those fecal microbes. Because those fecal microbes live very brief lives. They only live for a few hours unlike mammals and other large creatures, when they die, when those trillions of microbes die, they shed their component. But specifically, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin. And that endotoxin enters the bloodstream, and that's called endotoxemia. And that is how microbes in the small intestine export their effects to all other parts of the body, brain, heart, coronary arteries, skin, uterus, prostate, liver, name an organ, endotoxemia can affect that by endotoxin that originated in the 24 feet of small intestine. Now you may experience this as a variety of different conditions. It could be experienced as an increase in blood glucose high enough to be classified as type two diabetic or a pre-diabetic. It could be enough to raise blood pressure hypertension. It could be enough to impact brain chemistry and, and biochemistry, leading to beta amyloid uh, accumulation, which by the way, we know comes from endotoxemia in many, if not all cases. Uh, that leads to dementia. It leads to recurrences of atrial fibrillation. It leads to rupture 
of the soft, fatty components in the coronary arteries, thereby triggering heart attack and sudden cardiac death. It triggers the disruptive change in the skin you might experience as rosacea, or in the muscle and joints as fibromyalgia. So I think, I hope you can appreciate this disruption due to antibiotics in the gastrointestinal tract, but specifically with consequences in the small intestine, has led to a marked increase in all these diseases of civilization. Conditions, by the way, that hunter-gatherer populations unexposed to antibiotics simply don't have or almost never have. And so we step back and recognize that a lot of these problems are caused or were caused by our exposure to antibiotics. Please don't hear that we should do away with antibiotics. There's a time and place. There are times when we absolutely do need antibiotics and other antimicrobials. But know that the indiscriminate, casual prescription of antibiotics is a very dangerous prospect for your future health. And it can result in many, if not dozens, of new health conditions in you, your family, and the people around you. So key is to minimize your exposure to antibiotics and also take steps to amplify your immune response. It's one of the things we do in my programs. We, of course, address vitamin D, very big. We address microbes like Lactobacillus reuteri and Lactobacillus casei. These are microbes that amplify your immune response. Lactobacillus plantarum. We do these things by cultivating them as yogurt or other fermented foods, uh, both human microbes like reuteri and Lactobacillus gasseri, as well as vegetable fermenting microbes like Lactobacillus plantarum and Leuconostoc mesenteroides. I know this gets a little tangled, I know, but if follow my conversations here in the YouTube channel, my Define Health podcast, my thousands of blog posts, WilliamDavisMD.com, of course, my super gut book. And one of the things uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about in coming uh, weeks and months is my new book, Super Body. Sorry about the name. It's not my favorite. But it's about how you can take control back from this silly, awful conversation called weight loss, which is very destructive and only temporary. And let's replace it with an awareness of what I call shape and body composition. That is the location and quantity of fat and muscle. You must pay attention to muscle if you want full control over health and where fat is located and the shape and configuration, the contours of your body. So for instance, one of the newest issues that's shown its head in the last 20, 30 years is something called myosteatosis. And all that means is the deposition of fat in your muscle and that has major implications for your health because one of its effects besides just reducing your strength and leading you down the path of frailty and loss of independence it also impairs the production of what are called myokines these are inflammatory mediators and growth mediators that are produced by muscle well that effect is impaired when you have myosteatosis so this is a topic i want you to stay attention to pay attention to and follow as i talk more about this that is how to minimize these phenomena such as myosteatosis and other forms of disordered fat deposition and loss of muscle